let's talk about atomic theory all the way up until the dawn of the 20th century. We begin with the question of whether matter is continuous or discontinuous. That is, is it a continuous substance or is it in specks and dots or atoms? Generally speaking, the time of Aristotle, the ancients thought that matter was continuous. You may recall that they had the four elements. But Democritus, who was actually an atheist who was trying to create in his own mind a universe that had no gods, he said that matter is made up of atoms, and those were the changeless things in the universe. And his thought was kind of buried up until the Renaissance. Then it came out and was published. In the 18th century, the work that was being done by the early chemists suggested atomism. For instance, the gas laws were, with, when you consider how gases behave, it just seems really, really the only way to think about them as particles that are moving around. And when a chemical reaction occurred, when we did the masses, it looks like something was staying the same and something was rearranging but actually staying in existence in a chemical reaction, hence atoms. The evidence for atomism continued to pile up. Uh, the experimentation with gases that we have done, for instance. You have watched the film that supports Avogadro's hypothesis by means of the law of combining volumes. When gases are at the same temperature and pressure and react, they always react in volume ratios of small whole numbers. Again, that suggests that particles are reacting. New elements were being discovered and new compounds were being formed, and they always seem to follow the same laws. When we took a quantitative look at matter, when we got better and better instruments to measure masses and volumes, it always pointed to the same thing that substances were made of atoms. The law of conservation of mass, although it didn't nail the coffin shut, certainly suggested that that was the truth, that there are atoms and they make up everything. The law of definite composition, as you see in your magnesium and oxygen experiment, you will find that the mass of magnesium and oxygen that react together are always proportional to each other. It's the same thing in zinc sulfide. Whenever we find zinc sulfide, we find that it's 66% zinc and 34% sulfur. That suggests again that it's made up of atoms that are always combining in the same way. Here is a 2014 set of experimental evidence from the Johnson High School labs that show that as the mass of magnesium goes up, the mass of magnesium oxide produced goes up, and therefore the mass of oxygen is the same. And the R squared value is 0.9366. Remember, perfect uh, cohesion with a straight line is a 1.0. So again, it's more evidence in our very own lab for the existence of atoms and the fact that they are combining in regular ways. The reaction of magnesium with oxygen gives the same mass ratio each time within experimental uncertainty. And the law of definite composition has been tested millions of times over the decades with many different compounds. Dalton came along in the early 19th century and he suggested that all matter is made up of atoms. Now that doesn't go beyond Democritus but he is doing this from experiments. He said that the atoms are very small, they're rigid, and they can't be broken up. Atoms of the same element, he said, are identical to each other, and that's why the mass ratios tend to be always the same. Atoms of different elements differ in their combining ability, and atoms combine to form particles of compounds. So all compounds are made up of atoms, of different but always the same uh, distribution of elements. 
he said that atoms are the smallest identifiable part of any substance. Dalton's theory is generally accepted today, but we know that atoms are not indivisible. They can be, quote, split. We also know that they're made up of smaller particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And we'll see in a little while that the Croatian Jesuit Rudyard Broskovich actually described an atom with parts uh, about a half century before Dalton. Now, in the zinc reaction with sulfur, zinc does react with sulfur to form zinc sulfide, and one atom of zinc reacts with one atom of sulfur to form one molecule or portion of zinc sulfide. We can say, if we can ramp that up to the gazillion size of atoms, we can say that one mole of zinc reacts with one mole of sulfur to form one mole of zinc sulfide. Remember, a mole is simply a collection of atoms of the same number, a huge number. Well, if we look at the periodic table, we realize that 65 grams of zinc is one mole, and that's going to react with one mole of sulfur, 32 grams, and that's going to form 97 grams of zinc sulfide. And that's why we say that zinc sulfide is always two-thirds zinc and one-third sulfur. The law of definite composition, then, supports atomic theory. There's more empirical evidence in the law of multiple proportions. That's a little more complex, but it's the fact that some atoms combine in more than one way. For instance, there's two kinds of iron sulfate. One is green and rusts in air, and the other is dark and doesn't react with air at all. Water, of course, and hydrogen peroxide are both elements of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, in the law of definite of multiple proportions, if you have two elements combining in more than one compound, that composition by mass is always in the ratio of small whole numbers. In hydrogen and water, it's 11% by mass and oxygen 89, but in hydrogen peroxide, it's 5.9% hydrogen and 94.1% oxygen. If you divide 11 by 89, you get 0.12. If you divide 5.9 by 94, you get 0.06, and that's a small whole number ratio of 2 to 1. There's another example. Iron in one oxide, 78, and oxygen, 22, and the other, 70% iron, 30% oxygen. The ratio of that composition is 2 to 3. Again, a small whole number, suggesting that atoms combining, now this time in different ways, are producing these two different compounds. Now, Dalton's model is real easy to draw. You just draw a rigid sphere because he didn't think it had parts. Now we can imagine that a set number of hooks or arrows attached to the next atom. In other words, he didn't know how the atoms attached to each other, but he knew they have combined in definite ways. So for instance, if we postulate that oxygen has two hooks and hydrogen has one, then that gives us our H2O that we know is the formula for water. We can also explain hydrogen peroxide, because if the oxygen is hooked together with another oxygen, then each oxygen has one more hook to provide for a hydrogen, H2O2. However, hydrogen and oxygen don't combine in any other way. This uh, H2O3 does not exist and has, cannot be, be found to exist anywhere. Dalton's model was important because it was built on experimental or empirical foundations, and it's the first model that had relevance to the study of chemical reactions. As we can see, it explains how, for instance, hydrogen peroxide breaks up into water and oxygen. The atoms are all still there, but they are rearranged in a different way. The mass of reactants is the same as the mass of products, but we have different substances that are formed in the chemical reaction. In Dalton's model, compounds are made by recombining atoms into new arrangements with other atoms 
but they're always reacting in the same way and combining in the same way. Dalton's atoms are indestructible. They never change in themselves. Uh, this is what Democritus said. And so chemistry is just a matter of finding out how it is that these atoms rearrange. Now, was Boscovich right? Dalton said atoms are indivisible. Boscovich had said earlier that they could be broken down into smaller parts. Scientists continued to try to test the theories after Dalton. Now, have you ever scooted across a carpet with crepe soles? When you touch a doorknob, you get a shock, especially if it's a dry day. Well, J.J. Thompson experimented with vacuum tubes. He uh, passed a very high voltage through the vacuum tube, and he found the positive electrode he called the anode, and the negative electrode he called the cathode. He found that, and we, you can find this on the internet if you find a Crookes tube, he found that the, there were particles that were flowing from the negative to the positive electrode. And uh, the glowing beam orig originates then at the cathode and moves to the anode. And if you take a magnet to it, you see that they are charged particles because they deflect. We can also see with the paddle wheel demonstration that they have mass and kinetic energy. Again, you can see this on another YouTube video. So, electrons have a negative one charge. They can be stripped from atoms just by shuffling across a carpet. And this is very easy to do to get the electrons away from metals. And we proved in other experiments that electrons have a mass about 1 1800th of that of a hydrogen atom. So Boscovich was correct in 1750. The atom does have parts, and very important, the electrons must be the easier of the parts to strip away from the atom. So the electron can come away from the atom. Now protons, discovered later, have a plus one charge, equal in magnitude to the electron minus one, but opposite in sign. The proton mass is almost 2,000 times heavier than the electron. And later, very later, the Chadwick experiments and investigations showed the existence of neutrons in the atom that are equal in mass to that of the proton plus the electron, but without any charge. That's why they were so hard to find. They didn't have any charge. So, the conventional way to treat the three particles in chemistry is this. The mass of the proton is considered to be one. The mass of the neutron is considered to be one. The mass of the electron, zero. The charges, proton plus one, neutron zero, electron minus one. Thomson's atom is made up then of protons and electrons. The electrons are embedded in a mass of protons, like raisins in a pudding. And the electrons of one atom attract the positive electricity of the next to keep unlike atoms stuck together in molecules. This explains the existence of chemical compounds. And there's a raisin pudding, and we ask the question, would this deflect anything? And that's the question that Rutherford later added. So Thomson's atom, we're left with this for now. Electrons are embedded in a sphere of positive electricity. This is a model now that can be tested but it's an improvement on Dalton's model because it allows us to stick atoms together to form molecules and therefore compounds.